I'm very pleased to be here to chair the final uh, session on COVID-19 and art activisms. Um, I apologize I wasn't here this morning, but um, I had to be doing something else. Um, however, it's a fantastic panel. Um, there are four speakers who are each going to speak for 20 minutes. Um, I think as in all the other panels, they will speak one after the other. Um, I'm not quite sure how to tell you when your 20 minutes are up. I'll just wave or write rude things in the chat. Um, but if you can try and keep to those 20 minutes, that would be good. Um, our first speaker is uh, Xiao Yinye from the Royal College of Art. And um, the, well, you can see it, but the uh, the topic is Morning in Demand of Publicness, Farewell to Li Wenliang as an on-site action and its online dissemination. So thank you. Thank you, Steffi. And uh, sorry, I changed my mind later because uh, when I submit the abstract, it was still a not mature idea. And so um, thank you really for having me here. Um, I am Nie Xiao Yi, Xiao Yi, uh, a last year PhD in Royal College of Art and in curating contemporary art. Today I will talk about an action and also online event, Farewell to Li Wenliang. I hope to firstly provide a detailed and accurate account of this action on site and online that culminated into a national event. And secondly, I will draw onto the work to discuss why crisis in the society transform into a crisis in art in China during the pandemic. First, let us roll back the time to February 2020. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, most people knew about this action through a post published by Weibo account, uh, Weili Wu Chong the Wei Shu on 9.57 a.m. on 7th February. The text briefly says, the backside of Tonghui River, Beijing, Beijing Tonghui Hepan. There are three horizontal images. The first one overlooks the ground from a vantage point. In up one third of the image, a large area of land was covered in snow. There are several bungalows, neatly arranged squared bushes and cars, adding some gray and brown touches to the image. And a long gray wall enclosed the bushes in a huge yard. The bottom section is the Tonghui River, that might have frozen slightly on the surface, reflecting on the bare willow on the bank. Then we focus on the river bank, the geometrical long white stripe composed by several segments of slopes. A person in a black coat was standing on the narrow path between the slopes in front of five giant Chinese characters clearly inscribed into the snow. It seems to be a quiet winter morning. The air is fresh as everything demonstrates its clarity. Um, apart from his person, no one else was there. In the second image, the lens pushes up and we find the man lying by the side of the characters. His body in black is in the snow, parallel with the characters. In the third photograph, the man stands along the stairways, looking at his final work before leaving the site. It has also become a clear now that was the shape of his body in the snow has left an exclamation mark. The five Chinese characters says, farewell to Li Wenliang, song bie Li Wenliang. And later a video also came out on the internet. It shows that the man lets gravity draws his body into the snow and he squatted down to make a firm round point of that exclamation mark. I'll show us. According to the weather forecast, Beijing was minus eight to minus three centigrade that day, with moderate snow. Who is Li Wenliang? You might have heard about his name before. He was praised as the whistleblower of the pandemic. He was a doctor in Wuhan Center Hospital. He reminded people in WeChat groups to take cautious procedures before the official announcement. 
He was one of the seven doctors who were criticized by the local police for diverging information without the authorized permission. He was celebrated as a civilian hero who acted according to his conscience. The night before 7 February, Lee passed away because of coronavirus. That long night was the saddest internet timeline I have ever seen. Lee passed away at a time when the country was still in a state of emergency, of mass scale mobilization and strict lockdown. And there was a shared emotion, a mixture of desperation, anger, sadness, willing to fight, mutual care, and alliance. The passing away of Lee, to some extent, became a breakthrough for these emotions. When the news of Dr. Lee's death came out, the morning occupied the landing page and timeline on my Weibo. Later, this post of farewell to Lee Wenliang came out, and it was kept being reposted by hundreds and thousands of people, becoming a sign for the shared sadness and mourning. That synchronized and relay action of reposting in the virtual public space remind me of Judith Butler's discussion about the public assemblies in Tahir Square and on streets in Hong Kong in her book, Notes Toward a Performative Theory of Assembly. Reposting together turns into a visual form and at the same time a political form, demonstrating the mobility and alliance based on the network and infrastructure of virtual connection. Until 27th October, this post has been reposted more than 154 thousands of times, and there has been other circulation on platforms like Weixin. Like most people, I came across these images on the social media. Despite the fact that I was not in China, I was synchronized with the waves of information and mood on the Chinese internet, or you could call it Jianzhonghuliangwang. When looking at the Weibo timeline filled with these images, I was speaking to myself, this is a political moment in my generation. But I was also thinking, among all the mourning, why did this action and these images receive the most um, reverberation? Is this related to the fact that it was a physical action or because it has a slogan-like demonstration? When Butler discusses street politics, she emphasizes the importance of embodiment. She asks, could we still understand action, gesture, stillness, touch, and moving together if they were all reducible to the vocalization through speech? For me, this action, farewell to Li Wenliang, reclaimed the right to physical spaces, to bodily actions, as well as to silence. During the lockdown, the digital space was anxious, crowded, and clamorous. If you don't make a sound or type out what you think, there will be no signal of your existence. But when the man in black coat was lying down and gazing into the sky, there was a silence that could not be vocalized in another form. At the same time, this act was highly personal. As an individual's creative response to the death of Dr. Lee, it seems that he was not expecting a feedback, nor has he claimed authorship of this action. It is his personal and anonymous nature combined with the penetrating and monumental form, set up the final presence for an unpredictable publicness. It resembles to a grand political slogan in public spaces in China. But one realizing that an uh, exclamation mark was, has been written by the man's body, this slogan then is transformed into a resolute and decisive declaration. To some extent, it was an alarming reminder for people Right now, the most important thing is to say farewell to Dr. Lee, to pay your tribute, to say thanks, and to mourn for him. Despite this action has been widely circulated, the basic information about it has been unclear. People generally consider the account that posted the image um, is the author, but it was not confirmed. And we are not sure if there was any mediation between the action and the documentation. After some time of searching, I found the original author who took these photographs, a witness of this action. And I did an interview with her. She would love to be called as Ferris Wheel Maintenance Man, Xiu Mo Tian Lun Le. She was a young photographer in Beijing and lived opposite to that riverbank on high rise. On the morning of 7 February, um, to be more accurate, 
8.56 a.m. She spotted the action when it was ongoing, captured it with her smartphone, and shared these photos with several friends. These images then spread quickly through personal networks. And when they were posted online nearly one hour later, this action became a national phenomenon. In this sense, the man who did this action, the photographer and people who shared it, are all contributors in transforming an anonymous and spontaneous action to an event without any mediation. Later in that day, there were some bunches of fresh flowers left on that site. And in the afternoon, when the clouds in the sky dispersed, the photographer saw that man in black came back again. He stood by the side of the cactus, looking at it in the sunshine, and then slowly walked away along the river. Later, more writings also came into existence on the river bank. They were saying, go Wuhan, Wuhan Jiayu, and China will succeed, Zhongguo Bisheng. How this event has happened is actually not a mystery, but the action itself has a resolution and strength which inspires me so much in thinking about art. This action itself did not take place in an art context. Not all people consider it as art. For example, the photographer is against calling it art. In the following section, I want to first I left, acknowledge- I left your coffee there. Oh, sorry. Um, which part? Uh, in the following section, I want to first acknowledge this action does not claim to be art, but from my own point of view, it is such a penetrating and powerful artwork. And then I will draw on the strength of this work to think about suspicion and disbelief in art among Chinese artists and art workers during the pandemic. Among the, uh, all the art genres that we could describe five well to live with Liang, on-site performance and online art engagement might be the most obvious text. But such clarification emphasizes more on like certain medium or about the platform like Weibo and Instagram. I will also call it as a performance, but I hope to position it into the history of Dada or actually like the frenetic behaviors of Asian Chinese literati like Ranzi, in the sense that it is expressing a political and social concern in a highly personal and creative approach. I hope to borrow scholar Jonah Westman's definition. Performance is a set of questions and concerns about how art relates to people and the wider social world instead of a medium about body or action. This definition also left, uh, leaves much space for the rule of audience. For me, it is actually the undefined and un non-conforming state of the work and its relation to the world. Especially, it is my experience of being inspired and haunted by it. Makes me claim this work embodies such imagination accuracy as great art. Back to February, China was the first country that fell into the state of national lockdown. For most residents in China, their lives were also suspended and I observed a widely spread uh, suspicion towards art among Chinese artists and art workers when looking at the friend circle Peng Youquan or Weibo. Some artists stopped their work because they could not access their studios. Well, some lost their faith in doing art. In the late January, our newspaper Chinese um, sent out invitations to artists and asked if they could make some art, do something or just write something many declined. A discussion was also hated about Seattle Adorno's famous sentence to write poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. Many considered it as in, uh, inappropriate work on art and literature in a time of catastrophe. However, when later Europe and the US entered into the lockdown, I did not observe like a similar degree of suspicion or caution towards art. This led me to question, why did the Chinese artists feel awkward in the situation? And how did the crisis of the society become an art crisis for this Chinese contemporary artist according to my very biased observation? The artist's caution to the political climate reminds me of the 1990s when some Chinese artists intentionally turned away from themes like Chinese identity and feminism 
because they were afraid that their art would become a political pose and fall into the trap of playing the identity card, da shen fen pai. But I hope to point out that this time is not only about distancing, distancing um, from the politics, rather some of this depression actually emerge from the inability to engage with the society. Many artists, in fact, have deep concerns and almost a sense of responsibility to engage lively. In China, there is a long mainstream tradition that art and literature interconnect with the politics and society. In the ancient time, there were no professional artists and the literati in the elite class uh, with political power made art, like calligrapher Yan Zhenqing. In the modern time, Mao Zedong's talks at the Yan An Forum on Literature and Art, Yan An Wen Yin Zhu Tang stresses art should be made for the masses of people. Since the 1980s, though contemporary art in China is often depicted as victim of censorship, artists were actually also active in engaging with the um, ideology, the society, especially when many of them were also intellectuals. C.T. Xia, Xia Zhiqing, a founding scholar in the history of Chinese modern literature, considers that the Chinese literature works from um, 1917 to 1949 were hunted with great concerns, and there was a moral sense in society and an obsession with China. In Chinese, it's called Gan Shi Yu Guo. I think many, many contemporary artists in China nowadays also share this strong concern over society and carry this into their works. In short, in my opinion, this art crisis is in fact a combination of turning away from politics and at the same time, the sense of responsibility of engaging in politics during the time of pandemic. What I am trying to make after of, um, the action, farewell to Li Wenliang, is not about whether this action is art or not, but rather why artists should still trust in art. This action shows us that how much people are still in need of an imaginative, penetrating and hailing expression, especially in the time of difficulty, and how much hope and solidarity it could bring across isolation. It also reminds great art, no matter it is made when facing the society or in solitude, emerges from a profound and solid understanding of humanity and the world. If the photographer did not capture the action, if no one had seen it, if only the river and the sky have been the witness and the snow melted down and no trace of the words is left, will the power is of this action be diminished? My answer is a clear no. It stands in its own context and its own situation, responding directly to the death of Dr. Li Wenliang. The man in the black coat no matter what happens, he is the bearer of this action. As for the audience, including me, I think we are the lucky ones, sharing that power he has inscribed into the snow. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It was wonderful. Um, the next speaker is uh, Bao Hongwei from the University of Nottingham. And Hongwei's uh, learning German in my kitchen queer diasporic engagement with the pandemic discourse. Over to you, Hongwei. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Steffi. Let me, okay. So, so I suppose that you can see my PowerPoint now. Great. Okay, so my talk really follows the uh, Xiaoyi's talk. Xiaoyi's example is really about how artists in China engage with the pandemic discourse and how they bring their kind of obsession with China on, or some concerns with national identity actually in their artworks or in their what, social engagement with society. And my example deals with the overseas Chinese or queer diasporic artists and how they deal with issues of identity in a pandemic discourse. And my example is uh, Fan Po Po, uh, Chinese queer filmmaker, artist and activist, a lot of you might have heard of Purple's name or uh, seen his films, and he's known as one of the most prolific uh, 
Chinese queer filmmakers from China. And he was born in 1985, only what, 35 years old. Yet he has been extremely active in the past 10 years to 15 years, graduating from Beijing Film Academy in film studies or script writing in 2007. On the same year of his graduation, he published a book called Chun Guang Zha Xie, so Happy Together, Complete Record of 100 Queer Films, which is the first book on queer cinema published in Chinese language in the PRC. So the film also is kind of a collection of film reviews and film synopsis of queer films from all over the world. However, it showcases his interest in queer films. And after that, he participated actively in queer filmmaking and activism, and in particular, Beijing Film Festival and uh, uh, China Queer Film Festival tour, Festival tour, which is to bring Chinese queer films to different parts of the China. And he also well, organizes a kind of queer university video training workshop for uh, community members. So that's a brief film and videography of Po Po. You can see that he's extremely productive. Although well, some people may argue that some works are extremely short, like 20 minutes, 10 minutes, etc. Still, it's remarkable that uh, at such an age, he has produced such a wide range of works from documentaries to... Uh, so uh, the column on the left-hand side are the documentaries he made before, primarily before 2016, before he left China. And the column on the right-hand side, especially those in blue, are his works, uh, 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 fiction films. So where he explored a variety of issues such as love, sex, sexuality, or interracial encounter and so on and so forth. So my talk will be focusing on what was the abstract my talk focused on one of his uh, artworks, which, called, which is called Lian Lian Deutsch in my kitchen, Learn German in my kitchen, which is a two minute short video, which we're going to see in a minute. But I also talk about his other works well, in the pandemic from this January to pretty much the present. He's extremely active and very busy. So, some of you might be familiar with his documentaries, which primarily portrays queer community life in China, including Mama Rainbow, Papa Rainbow, which talks about uh, queer children's relationship to their parents, a new, China, a new Beijing, new marriage, which is a, a documentary about a same-sex wedding photo shoot uh, taking place in Beijing. It's a performative documentary. However, since one event, which is 2014 to 15, his work was banned in China, was taken away from some Chinese streaming websites, and he subsequent, uh, subsequently uh, uh, took Chinese, Chinese censor, the state administration, a radio, film, and television soft to court. And although uh, the court, uh, the soft uh, official statement is that we didn't censor your film. However, his films still cannot be seen in China. And later, he after this court case, he realizes that, that his career as a filmmaker basically ended in China because no organizations or no venues would host his film screenings and no website dare to show his films. So he also faced a dilemma about whether to stay in Beijing or not, because it seemed that Beijing at that time, I mean, especially after the 2008 uh, Olympics, has undergone a huge wave of gentrification, and all those spaces, or community art spaces, seems to be vanishing, or they have been gentrified to cater for an international art market. And the queer scene as well, the, the, the uh, queer scene on the one hand has been marginalized in the political discourse, but on the other hand, they have been increasingly gentrified, to, well, catering to a middle class urban uh, gay community. So that's his worry. And that, at, at that time, he got a scholarship or got a fellowship uh, in Berlin to do a film script workshop or film script project. So that took him to Berlin. So my 
examples below pretty much draws on his works since he arrived in Berlin and in particular this uh, short video uh, made in made in this uh, April but before April what many Chinese or many people of Asian heritage have encountered a lot of racism in Western societies, for example, I have been well, abused and uh, spat on by people on the streets, even in Nottingham. And in Berlin, it seemed that uh, Purple has experienced worse situations. People call, have called him on, uh, have called him Corona, have cursed him and so on and so forth. So once he was uh, uh, verbally abused in a wubang, uh, in a subway in Berlin. So he, well, as a filmmaker, the first response that he has is to take off his mobile phone and then took this video. And then he subsequently took this video to the police station. Of course, the police, police didn't do anything. And the police even blamed her, blamed him on shooting that, that person, on infringing that person's privacy and so on. So Popo realized that uh, he needs to do something actually to tackle this issue, to address this issue. So that comes to his video, Learn German in my kitchen. And I'm going to share the video, but I realized that I've got to stop, share, and then re-share in order for this to work. So the video is commissioned by RBB or Radio Berlin Brandenburg as part of their project called Vierwender Berlin. So uh, for four walls, well, inside four walls in Berlin, which is basically encourages artists to make artworks during lockdown and within their rooms or within their flats. So that's Van Poeple's work. Okay, so that's Van Poeple's video. I understand that uh, it's in German, I may not well, uh, make full sense, but uh, a lot of the, okay. I hope the video is not playing. <laughs> okay, so I'll highlight some of the important points in this video. So in this video, Purple really talks about uh, what the kind of 
China-related racism uh, circulating in Western society. And uh, at that time, Trump also famously, famously called coronavirus as a China virus. So that simply exacerbated the kind of xenophobia in many parts of the Western society among certain groups of people. So in this video, Fan Po Po actually first uh, shows the kind of stereotype of Chinese based on rumor. So Chinese as bat eating nation. And then in the video, he really put pause some plastic bats used for Halloween into a saucepan. And, and then he, show, he says, no, I have never eaten a bat. Now it's have me and a Fledermaus Gagessen. So he doesn't use a kind of plural way or we Chinese or the Chinese, but he used a first person singular, I have never. So basically it's kind of very individual and personal type of address without trying to make generalizations, without trying to be obsessive with China, use uh, the quote from, from the last talk. And also he talks about Wuhan, but instead of talking about all the sufferings and all the kind of what, lockdowns and uh, 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 situ stereotypical situation which fits into people's imaginations of Wuhan. He talks about his memory of Wuhan. So mian, the kind of dry, uh, hot noodle as a kind of his uh, a hallmark of uh, Wuhan, the city in his memory. So in doing so, he really humanizes Wuhan in the pandemic discourse. So that's the first aspect. The first, uh, second aspect is uh, when it, talk, uh, it comes to being a uh, virus. So he uses kind of a language learning flashcard. So people would expect to see a what, virus figure. But in fact, you have this video from the Wubang, which this person actually curses him saying that you are a virus, you, you are coronavirus and so on, indicating that really it's racism that is a real virus in our society. So that's his engagement. And at the end, he uh, write, uh, writes, coronavirus doesn't distinguish between nationalities. What about us? What about we? So that's uh, a two minute short video, but it was broadcast on the kind of uh, Germans, well, our national broadcaster, kind of a local regional broadcaster. And he has received a lot of readers response to his video, in particular, the Asian population, the Asian communities responded positively to this, to this video. And Fan Po Po started actually to make alliances with the Asian communities in Germany and all over the world. For example, he has organized some film screenings and talks with, with the Asian community, prim primarily Vietnamese communities in Berlin. And he has also well, held talks with people in Japan, with Korea, and so on. So in, 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 the, in doing so, he's constructing a kind of Asian identity, diasporic, queer Asian identity within the discourse to counter the kind of singular discourse about the Chinese identity. So this is a what event that he held with Wen Yong, a uh, kind of what, uh, first generation, the earlier generation of migrants to Berlin. So they talked about how Asian queers have been marginalized in Berlin's queer spaces. And uh, he also what, taught, uh, had engagement with people from East from Middle Eastern origins, for example, in this uh, video, he had a talk show with Amir, who is from Middle Eastern origin. And they talked about something, which is that both the Middle Eastern people and the East Asian people have been marginalized in the European, in, in, in Europe and in Germany. However, they seldom look at each other. They seldom learn from each other and collaborate with each other but they kind of grow this hatred against each other. So, uh, so the person who abused him on that day on, on Wubang was actually Turkish origin. So this notion is very interesting. So we all look to the West, how can we see each other? Can we see each other at all? So this leads to a film exhibition program that he curated called, How Can We See Each Other? And in this program, he 
juxtaposes Chinese queer or Asian East Asian queer films with the queer films from East uh, from Middle East or from uh, East Africa. So the idea is to look east instead of look west to forge kind of eastern eastern alliances instead of I mean mutually marginalizing each other. And this is also reflected in the fiction film that he has made. So in the film Beer Beer, he shows a kind of skepticism towards the kind of racial dynamics, especially uh, the German East Asian dynamics uh, uh, embodied by the rice cream figure in queer communities. And this year he completed a porn film called Hey Zero, which Okay, great, thanks. So you know, I'm going to finish in a minute. So which uh, well, really features black uh, and uh, uh, black and white and lesbian porn sex. So this is an important, this is an interesting porn film. But I'm what, what I'm trying to make is that through those engagements, uh, Purple is trying actually to imagine identity in a different way. Instead of being obsessed with national identities, he explores the kind of regional ident identities and different types of political and geographical and cultural imaginaries. Instead of identity, he looks at identification. Instead of identity, in, in, instead of identification, he also looks at disidentification as well as queer connections. That's all. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. Sorry Hattie. about that. Oh, don't be sorry. It was wonderful. Um, but um, we're moving on um, to Laya Anguiz uh, from Northumbria University, uh, speaking on street art in empty streets, the significance of urban art and culture during a pandemic. Thank you. Is Angus here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Oh, oh, brilliant. Sorry. Anguis, sorry. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, hello, everyone. And, and uh, I would like to start by, by thanking the, the organizers for all, all the efforts to arrange this event, uh, despite all the, the difficulties of this year. And also because the, the resilience to, to adapt to a constantly changing uh, situation reminds uh, me of our own efforts as a, so a society in order to, to stay positive, creative, and uh, uh, relatively productive despite the, the challenging times. And, and this links with, with the subject of, of my talk, which is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on, on street art and, uh, and urban culture. And I guess at this stage, no one needs an introduction to the features of the situation we are going through. So I'll just point out that, uh, as you are aware of, cities around the world have been particularly affected by, by the situation. And the changes in our way of living have been especially evident for city dwellers. And um, Leia, can you hear us? Yeah, I, I'm here. Can, can you see my screen? We, we, we can't see uh, your screen. Um, well, we can see you, but you're, you're sort okay. of breaking up a little bit um, and freezing a little bit. Do you have a PowerPoint to share, don't you? Yeah, I'm trying to share it, but uh, okay. I, I um, guess it's not working now. Fantastic. Yeah, well, we, we just had it just there. Oh. 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 I'm, I'm trying again, sorry okay. for all the technical <laughs> no, no, difficulties. No. Yeah. Okay. Is it there now? Okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay, uh, I was uh, explaining how the, the changes in, in the way of living have been especially evident for city dwellers and also how the scarcity of open spaces and the difficulty to avoid crowded places have added an extra layer of psychological struggle to the inhabitants of densely populated areas. Uh, moreover, most of the largest outbreaks of the virus have so far focused on cities. Uh, so I've, um, I will be sharing how this has affected uh, street art. 
I, I aim to bring a reflection on how COVID-19 and its associated periods of lockdown have restricted, inspired and transformed urban art and culture in different cities around the globe. Uh, during this time, street art has not only developed new iconographies, but has also gained new motivations. Moreover, it has strengthened its social and collective commitment, effectively engaging with the mental health and the well-being of the inhabitants of cities. In this regard, and looking beyond the mainstream definition of street art as mainly related to graffiti, I will also allude to the appearance of urban performative cultural manifestations at the margins of public and private street spaces. Regarding this subject, I will show a few examples of ways in which the general public has engaged with the participatory cultural events taking place during the lockdown. Um, uh, I have tried to feature as many examples as possible. That means that I won't have the time to comment on all of them, but many of them will be just the background to, to my words. But uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions on, on them uh, later on. Uh, I would like to, to issue also a little disclaimer, and um, it's because of the subject of this conference, I have tried to collect as many reactions or allusions to China as possible. Uh, however, I, I do not speak uh, Chinese. I'm not an expert in, in Chinese culture, so I apologize because I realize that my, my talk may be too Western-centric. Um, also, this is a research project that I have started only a few months ago because uh, for me, as for everyone, coronavirus is quite a new, a new reality. So uh, yeah, I'm still collecting examples and I'm happy to, to receive uh, as much feedback as possible on this uh, because it will help my, my research. Uh, also, I'd like to mention that because of the, of the nature of a street art, very often the authors of the artworks or the date of creation remain unknown. And I have tried to add uh, details regarding authorship when, when these are available. And for dates, I have referred to the date in which the artworks became like available in, in social uh, networks or online, and which doesn't mean that that's it exactly the, the moment in which they were created, but when they became accessible. Uh, okay, uh, well, I, um, I will start by talking about the appearance of new themes that had never been part of street art before the pandemic. This emergency we all have gone through has, like in every crisis, adapted, um, exposed many of our most primitive human weaknesses. And the mitigating strategies adopted by each country may have been different, as well as the impact of the virus in the population. However, when subjected to the stress, fear, and frustration associated with the pandemic, people around the world have acted in related ways. Street artists have captured some of our primary reactions, sometimes with compassion, sometimes with humor, sometimes with anger. And I think one of the first challenges was to represent the virus itself. So to display the fear towards an unknown microscopical enemy, uh, artists have recurred to different images. Uh, for instance, they have rescued uh, medieval and early modern iconographies of historical plagues, and, uh, symbols that have been used in the past. Uh, for example, in on the right, you have uh, those one of those right and they're looking Venetian doctors of, of the um, early modern plague. Also, on the left, you have uh, one image that has been recurring in Catholic countries, which is the a slightly satirical or maybe slightly superstitious image of a saint, uh, which in the tradition had offered protection against plagues, and this has been very, very frequent. Another way of representing the virus uh, has been through the recreation of, of this uh, spiked ball that we are all already so familiar with different reinterpretations of it in, in the forms of caricatures, as, as you can see. Also, uh, word games featuring the name of, of the virus are very common. And this, uh, this allusions to this Mexican brand of beer that people have been leaving on shelves of supermarkets, this sort of the, of the panic buying. This, this is also quite frequent. Uh, as well as the allusions to, to panic buying that have appeared in many Western countries where artists have satirized our instincts of, of survival that led us to accumulate tons of spaghetti and, and toilet paper. Um, at the same time, artists have also emphasized, empathized with our feelings of loneliness and isolation. 
The images of people caged in their own homes are common, as so are the cases of masked couples, which have become a symbol of our unfulfilled desire for human touch. Mm, also, the, the first uh, murals appeared during the, the COVID era, created a narrative out of the, of the fight against the virus. And as every story in its, in its heroes, uh, artists looked for them amongst medical workers, which became for the first time pop culture icons via their representation as angels or as superheroes. Uh, I think it's interesting to see the effect of globalization and the speed and unanimity in the adoption of these iconographies. There are, uh, these are just two examples, but there are very similar ones in, in countries really geographically very distant, as in India, in Chile, in Germany, just to name a, a few. Uh, instead, some other images have been more local. This is the case of scientists and fundraisers, uh, fundraisers uh, in people's sympathy in different countries, and they also became uh, local stars of the show. Uh, on the, um, the left hand side, uh, you have uh, Fernando Simon, who was the advisor, or is the advisor of the, the Spanish government in, in science, he's a immunologist, has become very popular in Spain. And uh, on the right, there is uh, Captain John Moore, he's a hundred year old uh, war veteran uh, who was raising funds for, uh, for, the, for the national health system by working on, on his backyard. And these are more local figures. Uh, together with them, there's like the appearance of, of new villains, like in, in every story. And um, well, I wouldn't want to get too political, but the uh, art, uh, street art is political in itself. And I guess that because of their, their questionable attitudes or because of their approaches to the crisis, several uh, world leaders and politicians have become targets for, for visual satire. And um, Actually, street art has always been politically charged, but uh, this time the message has, has become more global and, uh, and there's also new causes to, to fight for. And well, one of these causes, at least in the early, uh, earliest moments of the pandemic, was advising on public health. Um, at the beginning, many artists made efforts to spread uh, scientific advice, encouraging people to stay at home, to keep social distances, to wash their hands. And uh, these, these images are, are very colorful and very effective. And uh, they were also very popular among uh, young audiences. So in many cases, uh, uh, artists received uh, public commissions uh, and they were chosen as a way to spread the information. Uh, here you have uh, several examples in, in Senegal, in, in Palestine. But uh, in many cases, these, these images have been displayed on the walls of hospitals, schools, public buildings. Uh, in some cases, the commitment of artists went beyond the, the official recommendations and they, they engaged with the public good in a, in a wider sense. Uh, undertaking a, a duty of raising public morale in difficult times. One example of this would be the campaign Back to the Streets, which aimed to create a thousand murals in a thousand walls owned by property owners across the USA. The artist Tori Matti, uh, who you have on the picture on the right, uh, was one of the participants in the project. I would quote her words. She said, I wanted to find some way to help raise awareness and also give hope. A unique opportunity has arisen for artists during COVID-19, a period of a strong artistic expression, end quote. Indeed, by violating the lockdown to mock politicians, political leaders, to recognize healthcare workers, and to show solidarity with other humans, street artists have provided us with some relief from the psychological pressure of this period, and we, have, we must keep in mind their efforts. However, the support to official instructions and the positive messages have tended to fade away with the evolution of the crisis. In more recent months, COVID-related images have started to convey a new idea of rebellion, together with a claim for freedom. It may be just tiredness, or it may be, as I mentioned before, a graphic evidence of the growing distrust towards the way in which political leaders are handling the crisis. 
Um, but uh, in any case, more recent artworks increasingly portray the discomfort towards the dystopia which is offered to us as the new normal. In the same way, the, the nouns of the social inequalities arising from the crisis, as well as the financial interests underpinning it, are becoming more frequent. Uh, another subject that I think is interesting for this conference is the way in which graffiti has portrayed the attitude towards China. As everyone knows, as soon as the virus started spreading, so did racist and anti-Chinese messages, uh, in some cases bust, boosted by, by political leaders. Uh, most artists joined the, the hashtag in social media, I'm not a virus, to denounce anti-Chinese uh, xenophobia. Here we have two examples, uh, one is from Australia and the other one is from, from Rome. Um, however, this attitude uh, has not been unanimous in street art. Uh, I would show one example. Uh, is this vast mural by Blue, um, which shows um, an apocalyptic world invaded by menacing pandas. Maybe uh, this was not the artist's original intention, uh, but this artwork, which uh, is actually part of a, a festival, a public festival of a street art, uh, which is called Draw the Line, uh, can still be interpreted uh, um, through a racist lens. A further point to be considered is the fact that the creation of graffiti artworks, which even under normal circumstances tends to take place on the brink of illegality, became even riskier after many countries started their respective lockdowns. The unprecedented context with its associated uh, heavier police surveillance has led to technical changes, such as an increase in the number of artworks made using the stencil technique, just like the one you can see on the left. This technique consists on passing ink or paint over holes cut in cardboard or metal onto the surface to be decorated. Another popular technique during the lockdown period has been the weight-based poster, uh, which is like, like the one on the right, and uh, which consists in the preparation in the studio of drawing on paper, which only a few, uh, only a few moments needed at the site of installation, just to paste. Uh, the poster to the to the surface. Something that's also typical from this period uh, has been the modification of previously existing pieces of street art, such as the Bansky's uh, with the pierced airground, which is an artwork from 2014, uh, which had this this face mask added uh, this year. Also, the modification of uh, street signs or uh, or statues. In most cases, just by adding them a, a face mask. In countries where the, the lockdown rules have been especially strict, um, and the artists have opted for uh, like mixed uh, working from home strategies with, uh, with uh, shares and social media. For instance, uh, several artists have worked on semi-private uh, communal spaces that were easily visible from the from from the street or from the sky, such as terraces, courtyards, balconies. In some cases, these these artworks have been uh, recorded uh, with drones and then shared on social media. We have an example on the left, and. Um, in some other cases, artists have painted on canvas and then shared their outcome or hung their pieces from their balconies, from their windows, or attached them on the shops, uh, on, the, on the doors of, of closed uh, shops. And sometimes these ideas have taken um, the form of collective initiatives, such as the project Stay at Home Pejak uh, that you have on the, on the picture on the right in which the Spanish artist Pejac invited people to interact creatively with the urban landscapes on the other side of the windows. Some artists have even swapped paint for light and have projected their artworks on the facades of neighboring buildings. This idea took hold also for public monuments, which were lead to render homage to medical workers, or in a similar manner, theaters around the world and leave their buildings in red color to denounce the risk to their survival posed by the COVID restriction. I think that the, image is, uh, the image on the right is especially moving because um, it encourages neighbors to talk to each other, like 
to ask uh, to each other how they feel and how they are. And this is this has been especially important during this period. Uh, we can even have appeared at Bansky's bathroom when he shared on his social media that he had also started working from home. But uh, for me, beyond the professional artists, what is interesting about this, this period is the fact that many people have felt the need to express their hopes, their fears, or, or the younger via techniques related to street art, from children painting with chalk on, uh, on the sidewalks to banners on the balconies, all this, uh, this creativity brings a reflection on the fact that artistic expression may have helped us to stay sane during the, the lockdown ones. Uh, on this regard, I would like to share a few examples of collective participatory initiatives that go beyond the boundaries of what traditionally is considered as a street art. The forced confinement, the anguish in the face of uncertainty, the loneliness and the fear have made us feel insignificant. And in the solitude of our houses, we have looked outside and we have discovered that only a few meters away, other people were as lonely and as scared as we were. In an effort of collective resilience, we have established links with those neighbors who until a few months ago were only strangers. It all started with the applauses for health workers. But in the most densely populated cities, where the distance from neighbors is shorter and the number of people per square kilometer intensifies, the daily applause appointment was quickly enriched with creative ingredients. Some people brought musical instruments, some uh, hung flags or hand painted banners. Some people decided to dance on a roof. And soon calls to action spread across social media, inviting whole districts to fitness classes or balconies, to concerts of classical music, or to simultaneous festivals of mobile phone torches, like the one you, you can see on the picture on the right. Uh, in some cases, when important events took place outside, balconies displayed it. For instance, on the 25th of April, Italians celebrated their national holiday singing Bella Ciao from their balconies. Uh, in Cordoba, in Spain, people were not allowed to physically attend the ceremonies for the passing of the historical communist leader Julio Anguita, but they organized an homage in the form of red handkerchiefs hanging from their balconies. These examples of uh, urban culture have played a determining role in maintaining the mental health of city dwellers during a collective ordeal. They are an example of resilience through creativity that deserves to be studied in more detail through surveys and interviews with the population. I'm just going to quote a couple of, of examples of opinions of people who took place in this, uh, in this movement. We have uh, Asif Khan from London says, I like it because it's representing something we all want to say. With all the museums closed, it feels like art has found a way to come out into the public space and remind us why we need it here, and more than ever at this time. Another participant of the Spanish project Balcon en Carentena in Madrid said, quote, seeing my neighbors in person on these days feels much better than seeing my lifelong friends on a video call. So it's just uh, two examples. Uh, also, I, I find this one is is also quite uh, quite curious. It's like when uh, when students in the UK were asked to to self isolate in the dorms, they just used what, the only thing they had in hand, which were like post-it notes to to send messages to each other. Uh, there are, as you can imagine, many other uh, examples uh, that cannot fit into a talk. But I have chosen just a few which I hope have contributed to spark some awareness upon the significance of human art and culture as a tool for resilience and well-being, political criticism, creative expression, and mutual encouragement in these times. Uh, besides the significance for collective mental health, something fascinating on the subject of pandemic urban culture is the speed at which creative ideas and iconographies have traveled around the world. Of that I have just displayed a few examples. It is worth insisting that variations of the same ideas have been appearing again and again in cities of very different countries. On one hand, this phenomenon emphasizes the collective anonymous nature of urban culture. On the other, it evidences that artists like every one of us have spent uh, hours and hours in front of their screens, scrolling down their social media feeds, trying to make sense out of this period of collective madness. 
despite all the differences and inequalities that this pandemic has awakened, it has also made us one in our shared anxiety. The bittersweet note is maybe the fact that artists, like uh, all humans, have lost innocence with the evolution of this crisis. And maybe when all this apocalypse is over, not only our souls, but also our cities will bear new scars. Well, thank you, and I look forward to, to hearing your thoughts. Thank you so much, Leia. That was so great. Thank you. And um, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions for all our papers. I'm just going to move straight on um, to Whiskey Chow, uh, who is from the Royal College of Art, of course, is also a very well-known performer in the UK. Um, Whiskey's talk is The Queer Blue Sky, What Can Art Do During and Beyond the Global Crisis? Hello, everyone. Um, I think my internet is not quite stable, so please just remind me if I um frozen or I drop off. Sounds um, good at the moment, whiskey. Sorry. It sounds quite good at the moment. Just to reassure you. Oh, oh, okay, okay. That's that's great. So um, so I'm going to show you my PowerPoint. a minute let me scroll back okay, cool. can I see it can I see it yeah yeah cool okay so um I think today's panel is great because I think it's um, actually, although we are kind of like meeting kind of digitally and you are not kind of in front of me sitting in the seat and I can see like how your face react. But I do think this is a moment when history meets. Um, what, what I mean, I will tell you later. It's just like so fascinating. I just want to um, give you a brief introduction about myself. Um, so I'm a... Uh, I'm a performance artist and Chinese drag king based in London and I've been living in the UK for five years. Um, so my um, interest of um, my art practice is um, kind of engaging with um, queer masculinity and also kind of negotiating with the stereotype um, projected on Chinese or Asian body and also broadly engage with um, the more kind of like um, political issues. Um, so in this um, presentation, I will just um, give you some background or context, if you like, um, to introduce um, my experience before I moved to the UK because it's very important for me. I used to be a activist in my early 20s, um, getting involved into the um, LGBT and feminist movement in China. So um, that activist experience, um, shaping my art making a lot. And um, for the past decade, I just kind of like trying to explore um, if art can change the world, really. Um, so I move on, oops. Um, just to give you a little bit of the introduction of like, what have I done in China, like the main projects. Um, so basically this is the um, original version of the Vagina Molochs. Um, that was in 2013. Um, we want to show the respect to the original uh, vagina monologues. Um, and also that is the 10 years uh, anniversary when the uh, vagina monologue has been translated and introduced um, to mainland China by Professor Ai Xiaoming. And then so, um, but um, since the vagina law has been um, introduced in China, um, um, it has kind of 
um, being localized in different level, but we also feel that we have uh, some more kind of urgent issue um, to talk about or to engage with, uh, which fit in um, or being highly relevant to the female body um, in, in China. Or by talking about female, we not only talking about the cisgender um, female because we want to make it uh, inclusive. So we also kind of like feature the the trans woman's experience or um, uh, not kind of uh, limited to any kind of sexuality as well. Um, and then we did some kind of um, um, interview, like deep interview to collect the story from um, different women um, from different age, uh, class, and um, different area, like the city or, or the village. So um, that was um, what I've done when I was in China. Um, and then by the time I already kind of um, trying to um, make the invisible visible. Uh, this is a kind of outdoor installation in my early career or pre-career, um, which is a um, a kind of um, kind of interactional installation. Um, the pattern will only be revealed after um, being stepped on by people. Um, so in the end of the um, stairs, there's a crime scene and then people would not know like who killed those people and then those lesbian couple but they just say I'm not the killer but um, each one of them has contributed this um, so yeah I mean and then and then moving to the UK I try to bring my queerness in my practice I, I keep um, thinking like um, why that's me making the work so um, basically kind of bringing my own um, cultural reference and also kind of challenging the the um, the definition of um, drag or drag performance or what can be a drag king and also kind of like if you look at the the king that I'm on like it's basically me um, but it's like um, look at look at the face is is quite um feminine and kind of uh rounded so it's kind of like very different from that kind of uh, i would say racialized um uh, makeup skill or kind of sculpting the facial figures um in the in the west so um so i would just like call myself call this practice like chinese drag king um, so I developed a whole series of this, um, but also combining, combining this kind of like performing the others with, um, um, with the Chinese food, which is, um, I, I took down the beers and mixed them with the, the chopped pork and the parsnip and spring onion and, uh, made a uneatable dumpling, uh, and sent it to the audience. So this is like not consumable. Um, yes, yeah, you can say I invite some audience to make the dumpling with me as well. And so, um, yeah, I just kind of uh, looking at uh, engaging with the UK political and social context um, from a lens of um, a migrant, a queer migrant. Um, always questioning or um, challenging the authority or the um, power, um, which is like overwhelmingly imposed on individuals. Um, so the power can be coming from nation state um, or or from um, this kind of racial hierarchy, or it can coming from like uh, um, homonormativity, kind of, um, and but also combining with this kind of capitalism and consumer culture. 
but all kind of like imposing on the individual's body or kind of like coming from border control, making some kind of angry work, never please the audience. And so um, then when art and activism meet, I mean, I did some uh, um, work which is kind of featuring the queer idol's death and um, kind of um, integrating the society, the mainstream society and the norm. Um, and then and then curating the um, curating a program which is like uh, called Querying Now and then it's kind of amplify the marginalized um, queer Chinese diaspora experience and exploring the impact on their art making. So this is this is what I said when history meet like um, I used I already know Popo when I was in China and I invited him um, to, to screen his work as well. But what I want to really want to introduce is um, is uh, what I'm doing um, during the COVID-19 time. Basically, um, this is really when the arts and activist part coming together. I did a um, digital conversation with two um, US-based queer artists. They are both immigrant. And then they lead a um, project called In Plain Sight and um, um, kind of working with um, 78 other artists doing a um, national art activism campaign calling for uh, abolishing the deten immigration detention center. So they use the sky typing to um, send out a message to try to get rid of the boundary, get rid of the language barrier, and also uh, making people know, making people see there's a detention center just near them. Because basically the um, um, location they, they've select was just uh, in the sky on top of the detention center in different city across the US. We talk about we talk about precarity. We talk about um, how this kind of uh, intersectionality become the central point for us to um, to connect different marginalized group and create um, meaningful social change. Also, we talk about mutual care. How do you develop or how do you um, deliver this kind of um, radical care um, during the time of crisis? Um, this is Casos and Rafa. And also, I want to talk about the other project, which is um, is a digital workshop that I develop um, during the pandemic, um, especially kind of thinking of the um, the migrant in the UK uh, who are um, fall the fall into the gap of the kind of like um, protection system, being the first to be forgot, the last to be remember. Thinking about um, the experience of a migrant body trapped in a foreign country who take care of them. I mean, um, as also as like one member of this kind of precarious migrant group, I was aware that there must be someone who are more precarious than me. So I decided to um, deliver this workshop to them. And um, as you can see, I, um, I asked them to turn off the camera uh, for the whole 
period of time in the workshop, just me turn on the camera. So what I encourage them to talk about is their relationship with their bodies, um, with the trauma that they've been through during the pandemic or during the time they stay in this foreign country. Um, by doing that, um, trying to create a virtual safe space for them to process everything. So they're also being um, encouraged to change your name. I don't know who they are. They can just use their um, nickname. And but also I encourage them to create their own bodyscape by holding their phone as the camera and curating um, by themselves how they want wanted to be looked at not for the others just for themselves by doing that give them back the agency and kind of trying to see if we can collectively um making this effort to go back home to go back to our own body So this is um, some of the steals um, from the uh, participants. I also send them a consent form in the end and ask them if I could um, develop something from the footage. Um, they were happy to contribute. And some of the images are so interesting. And then they do really start to um, negotiate or to talk to or to look at their own body without without hiding, without avoiding. Um, some of them are quite satisfied actually. And what I want to end and want to show is this, um, which is um, basically the text you've seen is uh, written from a Mexican um, woman and then she has been living in the UK for a long time. So basically that, that text was what she wrote. Uh, she told us that she got the virus in the early March and um, she's, she was struggled uh, both in the survival for financial and physical. She has to save her energy to, um, to just save it and leave it for her work and so she can't do any exercise she's also struggling with aging um and she 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 was aware that she was sexualized when she was a teenager um so um so kind of she's trusting me and trusting the other participant and showing this kind of multi-layer um intersectional struggle and in the end create this um, short video which uh, she titled the first time i see myself in 2020 so the workshop was on the um, 26th of september um, so this work or her story um, making me confirm that um, how timely, how urgent this workshop is needed or this kind of radical care is needed. I think um, the whole thing of me kind of always thinking is, is about like as a individual, as an artist, how do you really make the world a better place by doing something but not only centralize yourself. Um, so yeah, that's the end. And thank you very much for listening. And um, you can find my content on my website. Um, welcome to follow my Instagram. Um, yeah, just thank you. Thanks so much, Whiskey. Um, so we've just had four extraordinary papers and um, We've got, um, I think, about 20, 25 minutes for um, for questions and chat. So uh, that's pretty nice. Um, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and just say that one of the things that came 
through from all the work um, was the different ways in which artists have found artists and people who are creating events. So that um, you know that that realm of creating creating um, both events and ideas um, is this question of sharing and to 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 what extent sharing is at the heart of what people have been doing. So looking back to um, looking back to the homage in the snow, you know, was that really something that was private or was it always going to, I mean, I know this is something you brought up, but was it really going to remain private? Would it have been a disappointment? I don't know if it had been, but it clearly wasn't. And you've brought it to us today and the photographer and so on and so forth. It's, it's had massive ramifications. Street art is by its very nature in public, but it's been a very different and mutated kind of publicness because of lockdown. And then Popo getting his works on German TV, that's quite interesting because it's its much more of an intervention. It reminds me of the kind of SARS 2003 interventions when Hong Kong filmmakers were making short films for TV, and yet he's doing it on German TV. So he, he's got a lot further than um, any kind of British space for sharing a Chinese migrant perspective. Um, so he's, you know, he's, he's achieved something massive there, actually. But again, you know, the, 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 is that is that at the heart of it that he has to share the story or is it that he's he's trying to I don't know um and then whiskey you've just said it to us is that you have found these projects about finding a precarity that is not your precarity but that of other people's and trying to find that line and a way of exchanging care and and reaching um towards a space where you can make people find themselves and, and find themselves feeling safer in who they are so amazing work from everybody. I just wondered if people would like to make a comment on that. And I will meanwhile with Lauren, look at the chat and see if there are other comments coming through. Harriet? Hi, yeah, I think it's a, forgive me for not being here this morning, I had to go to the dentist. But I just think it's it's been a terrific panel. Thank you so much, everybody. And I think, Laya, your um, apologies about it being too Western-centered, I completely disagree with. I think, you know, what your paper did was really kind of give us all a chance to see the global um, significance of how street, whatever you want to call it, street, performance, public, activist art, is productive of meaning. I mean, I think that's what I really want to say. So across all the papers, you know, I feel what we're looking at is art that whatever you want to call it, it's a, I mean, for me, the definition of is it art or not that Xiaoyi raised at the beginning is not really what the issue is. I mean, this is clearly engagement with shifting visual forms that are at the same time very, very politicized, they're productive of meaning and what they produce are ways in which we, um, as agents across different political systems, we contest and raise questions about dominant power, if you want, authorities. So the first, Xiaoyi, your first paper on um, goodbye to Li Wenliang, I mean, I found that incredibly moving just incredibly moving that in a, a political and visual context in which people since the Mao era and before have been really, really used to seeing characters written, big characters in public spaces. But in this case, it was a public expression of mourning, of um, potentially of dissatisfaction with the um, initial cover up of the government and so on and so forth. I think it was just very, very moving. And then always um, your second, you know, Fan Po Po's um, film stuff. I mean, it's fantastic the way in which, you know, in very, very short filmic pieces, he can um, produce um, a statement about anti-racism, which is fantastic. And then um, liars about how, you know, street art across the globe has um, engendered a sense of 
dissatisfaction of community cohesion and then whiskies you know brings it home in conditions of extreme precarity particularly for diasporic people so i think it i just congratulate you all sorry to sound so excited it's just a really fantastic panel thank you very very much everybody thank you thank you thank you harriet i mean i think that the point that i want to make is that this you know it's a theoretical point about what the visual culture in which we live does. It doesn't just represent meaning, it actually produces meaning and that's how it is political. It is productive of political meanings and subjectivities and I think we need to cling on to that idea. Sorry to go on about it. <laughs> Can I ask a question uh, for Whiskey? So Whiskey, thank you very much for those fantastic art projects. What What's fascinating about the Radical Care project is that you really exploit the technical specificity of the online performance. It's not that you record a video or you perform online and move it as a things just online. It's really that you exploit, or exploit all those interesting things such as people can hide their screens or they can mute their sound or they can show, just show part of their pictures and so on. Could you talk more about the kind of how you use the technical affordances of either Zoom or whatever for your art creation? Oh, wait. I think it's a good question. I think I think um, what I didn't mention before in my presentation was um, actually I I saw I see the the process as important as mm -hmm. the result itself. So when we when we are um, doing doing a thing like we are like no matter that is a frontline campaign or a kind of uh, workshop working with the community we always have to think like what is this for are we only looking at the result yes. so actually when i when i was delivering or when i was developing this workshop i spent a huge amount of time just thinking how can i just um talk to this like people is already concerned about the safety about of of zoom right so but i would say this workshop cannot happen in a physical space mm -hmm. because um so so how do i use the um the digital platform as a um you can call it shelter or some kind of protection for people and um just just letting them to have their own space and not worry about being watched we always have to be watched no matter that that is in social media or um, maybe you meeting a friend you want to present the most desirable part of you to them right so we always kind of like we we worry we we we're anxious how do i create a space to bypass this and then letting them um to have a deeper connection touching the most um tough experience um i mean i mean i'm, I'm not a kind of um um kind of digital expert i would say the COVID pushed me to become a kind of digital artist now um, I have to learn very fast, um, but um, Hongwei, you asked a very good question because I asked them to turn off their camera, I asked them to change their name, but what I asked them for the first um, kind of homework before we meet is to select an image which they can, they think that image, that thing can represent them. So. Um, so the first question, the first discussion is about why you think this thing can represent you? What is the relationship? So by doing this, open up, and it's, it's kind of another way to kind of talk about their identity without just saying, hello, I'm, I'm, I'm blah, blah, blah. I'm um, age, blah, blah, and I'm blah, 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 right? So it's, it's, it's a different way to kind of talking about what they believe or uh, who they think they are. Um, I mean, I mean, it's it's just like um, I think it's also kind of in response to this kind of 
um, like fast, fast consuming kind of um, social media, kind of uh, fast, short video culture. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to quickly jump in with a question for Xiaoyi. Um, the green bus in the photograph, I thought that that was something, you know, it was that kind of punctum, whatever it was, but it was, it was, it, it, it was the incursion into the, into the image. And I suppose I just wondered if you could think a little bit about how the photograph become, you know, ex extends itself, transcends the, the meaning that was meant by the mourner on the roof whether or not the mourner was sh deliberately sharing with us. Um, but then there's that green bus, which actually takes over the photograph and makes it into a much, if you like, better work of art, a, 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 more, a, a more complete um, image than had it not been there. So I just wonder if you could just think about the, the incursions, the interruptions, the surprises yeah. in, in, this, in this kind of work. I find it's quite interesting when we talk about um, because a lot of discussions in two days, um, especially yesterday's the panel about the digital part, um, actually brings in uh, like other host um, presentation brought in the idea of glitch and latency. This kind of break up like this very um, seamless um, flowing. And for me, actually, I deleted that sentence discussing about the green boss from my from my, uh, yes, because I, I was conscious of the time, but actually that aids are very, very important because it stood up, uh, it stands up from the whole color tone, uh, like in that image and it emphasized that it has many practical social, uh, it's not connotation, it's just like clues. It might be like, um, uh, like I, I haven't done like a proper job to try to trace because um, like the photographer uh, of this image was trying to still keep more um, anonymous also herself from being told. So I haven't got the real location of this site. But I think according to, it's also very interesting about the perspective because from the perspective of this man in the black coat, maybe he couldn't say about that grow gray wall. So maybe he couldn't say that green bus coach, but from like the point of view that this overview, the vantage point of the photographer, and we think like a, a very broad thing of like this whole image. And I especially like this one a lot. I think because of this, you find um, it's like in total a very serene and quite morning and seems to be like for me it's really like a good um, from the perspective pers aesthetics it's a really good image but then it is exactly those um, like different kind of type of cars I can even try to identify there's some um, Japan cars I think like the smaller one and this green coach and then there are some like the bungalows those have brought me to I think yeah this is a social environment it is not constructed and so especially I have been thinking that a lot and um, I also want to comment a bit because um, basically it was mentioning about like this project of the image, selection of image. I was thinking recently there are a lot of discussion about Avatar. Um, and to, to me, I think um, there are a lot of potentials and space in that work, the um, Goodbye to Live yeah. especially because we don't know the exact facial impression. Who is that man? The anonymous, uh, anonymous nature, yeah, I think, of that work allow us to project a lot into that work. And also another thing, I think Harriet mentioned that um, it might be a dissatisfaction um, towards the government or it might be others. But I think it's quite interesting. This is a very, uh, this sign, this work can uh, evolve into a, an event that um, bring everyone together. Mm. Uh, on the internet, especially because um, it emphasized the most important thing. 
and it doesn't say so much about like the attitude of the government, so the attitude oh. policy. It is because it demonstrates the most important message that everyone, yeah, shares the ground on, and so that is kind of like a, like a the the space. It kind of like actually um, enlarge the space for people to come in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Harriet, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to come back to that. I mean, I think, you know, don't get me wrong, um, Xiaoyi, I'm not suggesting that this is a form of opposition or protest at all. I think the way that you've just put it is very good, that it's um, enlarging the space within which all sorts of things can be um, interpreted without, re without uh, resorting to words. And I think it's important to remember, I mean, that, you know, this, this image of, you know, farewell to Li Wenliang is out there. So what people make of it online is in a sense up to them, you know, oh, it's, it's no longer just the photographer. No personal uh, image. Or, yeah. but, but clearly what you're describing is that it's become a collective image as well. Yes. So, but I think that the way you've just described it as enlarging space of meaning is a very, very, you know, is very wonderfully put. Yeah, I just want to follow a bit because it's quite interesting, this point. Um, I think I initially share like a very personal, I was reading a lot myself in that image. And then when I interviewed a photographer and also uh, because I also wrote about this art, uh, this piece in March and there are a lot of anger in that article. And then that ph photographer especially warned me and um, suggest that you should avoid this um, impression or like to one I put it in like when I was trying to provide an account by nature I need to especially be cautious and about about this um, this work about this uh, position yeah so this has been very um, revealing for me I mean also related to the discussion about whether it is art or not because I found um, when I see it's art uh, without any thinking, I just by nature, I think this is so brilliant art. And then it becomes an offense for some people. Uh, so that is also like why I put some, yeah, yeah. discussion here. Yeah, no, I understand that these things are problematic. I'd like to just um, also, I, there's a question coming for Whiskey, but I'm just going to quickly jump in for a question uh, with a question for Leia um, before we go there. And that's um, about your phrase satire and superstition, which uh, you clearly demonstrated in the images that you've taken and your um, your partners have taken from around the world. Um, but it, it, it is this strange kind of peeping out. So people are both taking, making fun of themselves and the situation, but also they're quite frightened and they're reverting to different forms of superstition. Could you talk a little bit more about that? And I wondered if anybody else has seen that in their own, um, in, the, in the work that they're also doing or looking at. Yeah, I guess like laughing at them uh, for ourselves is, is a way of, of uh, getting fear away. So it's like all the kids like playing with things that scare them. So it, it's at the same time, like, okay, we, we are laughing at this, but just in case maybe saints can, can protect us. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, it's like a visual joke, but uh, I, I'm, I was curious about the fact that this visual joke appeared in, in places which are traditionally very Catholic. Like I, I found these images in, uh, mostly in Italy and in Spain which have this tradition of relying on saints for, uh, uh, like, uh, <laughs> I, we tend to say in, in Spain that saints are like our aunties, so they, they take care of us. So, yeah, why, why choosing this image? There's so many ways of, of displaying this, um, uh, this fear, but, uh, yeah, just uh, I, I was... Uh, I was curious uh, about how it connected with older traditions from uh, from uh, older uh, uh, viruses or older plagues, uh, mocking at them, but at the same time relying in them. So yeah, it's, it's quite. Uh, I think that the visual joke is is there and it's, it's interesting. <laughs> Um, 
Florence, shall I read this question for Whiskey? I don't know if you've seen it in the chat, oh, Whiskey. Yes, I have. Please do, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, thank you, Leo. Thank you for that. Um, so this is a question from Jennifer. Um, Whiskey, would you characterize your practice under relational aesthetics or do you not care for such a label? Um, I actually, I mean, when when I come up with something, I don't actually think about those because I don't know what it is myself. Like, it's like, this is, I think it's, it's this is kind of like a, how artists, my work is like, you can't, you can't name it before you really do it. But even you finish it, you still can't fully understand the work. You have to, you have to like, I don't know what other artists, how other artists work, but for myself it's like, because I, I'm also a migrant. So I have this kind of, um, kind of language, um, not barrier, but it's, it's something there which makes me have to find the words for my work everywhere, every day, every moment. So it's like, sometimes I feel the urgency to make the work, but I, I might find the proper uh, phrase to, to describe it later, maybe a few years later. I don't know, but um, I don't know if, if Jennifer is just like specifically um, referring to the drag king practice. Um, but I would say if, if, if that is the, the case, then I think that work is, is much more kind of um, bringing in my understanding or my relationship with the queerness or um, also kind of to find a way to deal with my cultural identity. Um, I, don't, I don't totally feel I fully connected with the traditional Chinese culture. No, not for me or my generation, but something's there. And by moving to the UK, it creates some kind of distance for me to, to look at it. And also to kind of um, referring this kind of um, cross dressing culture in China, um, which is kind of um, earlier than Shakespeare, and um, kind of like letting these two kind of uh, parallel um, culture to, to talk to each other um, by inserting my own body in the context here, now. So, I mean, I don't think about the categorize. Yeah, can I maybe jump in a bit? It's Jennifer, hi, Whiskey. Um, just to kind of explain, because what I've, what I've noticed and I've seen so in quite a few panels, also from last year's panel, last year's um, conference when we had this whole discussion about activism, art activism, is that it seems to me artists everywhere are jumping in where, pol where politicians have failed or where politics have failed. So in terms of your um, project on Mexico, for example, I just caught the, the last end of it. So I apologize if I misunderstood. You're in a way playing the role of a social worker, of a priest, of a friend. You're playing all these different roles and it just seems to me artists are jumping in to, to do all these precarity or social care work. Is this a symptom of something bigger that our, that our politics is failing us, that our, that our social welfare is failing us? And that's where I thought about this idea of relational aesthetics, you see, where um, Claire Bishop talk a lot about relational aesthetics and where that doesn't really actually work in sometimes is somewhere. And we do, I know the, the discussion here is not about, is it art or is it not art? So the question to you is, are you an artist or are you not an artist? You know, but it's like, we do we not need to draw the boundary for art at some point? Because if art is everything, then it's also nothing. So that's kind of where I was coming in when you describe your work, it just sounds like, wow, that is your, 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 working on the relationships between people. So that's relational aesthetics, but then what might be the drawbacks to that? So that was kind of where I was hoping to, to suggest. 
Thank you. Um, I think I think um, I I used to think about like can can art really resolve the problem? No. <laughs> can art really do something? No. <laughs> but um, yeah, what 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 artists what artists want everything? What art can do something right? So it's like um, I mean it it took me some time to kind of um, really kind of. Um, transforming or transitioning from um, being an activist to be a artist and um, in terms of the jumping in question I mean um, I mean I don't know about the other artists but for myself I can only represent myself um, Basically, if if you are a a queer person and you aware of your sexuality in a very early age, and you can see no representation everywhere, like when you are when you are a kid, so what would you do, right? I mean, I mean, usually people will kind of like trying to queer read something and then so. Um, by doing that, bringing themselves some kind of um, pleasure. But um, what the others do, like um, the project that I that I mentioned, that I um, interview um, Casos and Rafa, um, basically, when we can't see the light, we want to become the light. Then art is just providing us a language or a tool to become the light, um, if it makes sense. I mean, I mean, I, I, I understand like different people have different kind of urgency and um, different kind of issue will just touch them. So, but what touches me a lot right now is this kind of precarity. Um, yeah. So I don't. I, I'm not trying to do everything. I'm not trying to steal the work from the social worker. I know I will never, <laughs> never achieve that. But at least I can do something, even it's so small thing. Even it's a, not a big number of a group in my um, um, workshop because it has to keep small. It has to. The conversation has to go deep. I have to give them enough space, give them enough space to talk, and I want to listen. So I keep the number very, very small. Um, that is what I can do, and I can also keep going on. I think this is like my understanding of um, activism, that you, you, can't, you can't change the world overnight. You don't have superpower, and you don't have even kind of um, super big privilege but from your position you can do some small things and by this kind of collective effort the, the change will be made if you look at the the election in the u.s this is this is the collective effort so yeah i mean that's it thanks um, we're we're out of time, and I think actually that's possibly the very best um, set of sentiments to end on because everything we've seen this afternoon has been um, about artists and people who want to make want to make an and not I don't want to use the word impact in the UK who who want to make an impression um, in the world um, making it um, and. I've just spent two years working in a collective of artists, curators, academics, activists, um, members of the public. And I have to say that, you know, although there are crossovers and there have to be interconnections for those people to work together somewhere and social workers and people who, you know, do the real, you know, basically wipe the bottoms of the world every single day. Those people are not necessarily the artists and they're not necessarily the academics and not necessarily the activists or, or or where those people all cross over um so i quite agree with you jennifer you know whiskey is not supposed to be a social worker <laughs> if you wonder you want to be a social, it's up to you but that's not where we are um 
but uh, I, I think we can just let art sit in our consciousness the way it has this afternoon because we see it and we feel it and we, um, we clearly have needed it. Um, I kind of want to end with that lovely image of those men on the windows in that, um, I think, was it in Spain? Um, quite extraordinary, anyway. So I'm sorry to bring this to an end, but I'm looking at the schedule and we um, need to pass back to our um, to our hosts and thank you all very much, very much indeed. Um, lots of virtual claps and thank you. And thank you to the YouTube audience as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Steffi, for your wonderful uh, chairing. And thank you for all four speakers to uh, offer such a inspiring uh, afternoon. And I'm really grateful for those two days that I can see so many ideas popping up. Uh, and I think that I'm, I'm very, very glad that there's this panel at the end of the two days. And there are so many things for us to continue to discuss. And basically it is during the pandemic when a lot of restrictions are in place, how do we express ourselves? Uh, when we see that, um, you know, different forms of uh, and media appeared everywhere, like the one that uh, uh, Leia introduced in the empty cities, and we can see uh, those um, uh, uh, slogans on the snow ground introduced by Xiao Yi. And uh, this reminds me, you know, when this um, characters uh, place there, and it will come and go. And I imagine that uh, later on the snow will cover the five characters, if not turning to three digits, four, zero, four. Um, it's, um, it's a kind of um, imagining uh, the reality and how do we receive this pandemic and how this pandemic can encourage us to think things differently. Um, and um, but thank you, or I would like to thank you all for, uh, the, for your participations as well. Um, and in particular, I want to thank one person, uh, that's uh, Dr. Lauren Warden, who um, has organized the whole thing uh, all the way from the beginning. And without her support, uh, we will not have this conference. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for your uh, consistent uh, support uh, for this uh, wonderful session. Um, I will only uh, use like two, three minutes to introduce the special uh, issue uh, because um, we always see this conference as a stepping stone for a special double edition in the autumn next year. Uh, each year it becomes a pattern. So we would uh, like to invite all the presenters, if you could consider to make your uh, presentation into a full paper that we will be very happy to receive your submission and uh, run into a peer review. Um, and we will have this uh, special edition in 2021 autumn. Um, the title is exactly the same, the world two meters away. Um, and uh, Lauren will be in touch with you to, um, to um, give us the step-by-step uh, the -step, uh, instruction in terms of when and how to submit your full paper. Um, I would really uh, be keen to see how those uh, wonderful thoughts um, come into shapes of uh, journal articles. Um, I know that um, there are still uh, people in this uh, Zoom room. And uh, I know that uh, a lot of colleagues, um, the first time I met like uh, um, Whiskey, uh, I know that you published with us before, but this is the very first time that we meet. Um, so I, I would like to invite you all um, to see, you know, you, whether you would like to stay on a little bit more, uh, even with a, a glass of wine um, to celebrate the completion of the two day event. Um, so I would, um, you know, you, you can, you, you're more than welcome to stay. We will keep the uh, Zoom running, uh, Lauren, if we can. And um, um, please uh, just simply uh, unmute yourself. You want to talk and uh, mute yourself back if you, uh, if you want to uh, uh, leave the conversation. Um, but this is the time maybe we can have another uh, 30 minutes or so to share together uh, 
um, because this is such an opportunity that we can meet colleagues in such a virtual um, uh, scenario. Um, and I know that I can see that there are still um, colleagues uh, from, uh, from the UK as well as from China, and there are PhD students here as well, and PhD um, applicants as well. Um, so we can, we can share the experience um, and, uh, you know, within or beyond uh, the framework of the topic of the conference. Um, so you are more than welcome to stay. Maybe we can have like five minutes break if you want to. Uh, sure. uh, um, Joshua sure. wanted to introduce um, next year um, annual conference. Oh yes, of course. Yes, I, my apologies. Uh, uh, Nuria, Nuria is our uh, uh, course director for MA Contemporary Arts China, and she would like to introduce uh, two three minutes about next year's conference. Hi everyone. First of all, thank you for such a brilliant conference and presentations. And just very briefly, because I'm sure everybody is keen to have a virtual drink, just to let you know that for next year conference, uh, our title is on transcultural curation, China as a method. Myself and Joshua are convening it with the support of, of Lauren. And we are organizing it with the Whitechapel Gallery we will be circulating the papers uh, soon and we look forward to receive your contributions. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we can take like five minutes break and we can keep the, the Zoom running. And um, once I've got my uh, glass of wine, I will join back uh, to you. See you in a bit.